Welcome to Jung Tuition. I am Jung. This continues discussing basic issues in physics in relation to global warming near the surface of the Earth. If you are interested in the related research, you certainly want to know what the stratospherical cooling means, because it is considered as a warning symptom of the surface warming that could change the climate just as one might have a fever after catching a cold. Today, I'm going to report my new evaluation on exactly how much surface warming would be given the stratospherical cooling predicted by Manabay and Viserold in 1967. In short, my newly calculated warming is half of what they predicted. So are you ready? I mean, to like, to subscribe, and to share, as well as to active your little bell so that you would not miss any of my new talks. Let's go and have fun. This is Dr. Manabe, the American Japanese meteorologist. Here he is presenting his Nobel physics lecture in 2021, in which he used a newly animated diagram to explain his key contribution, together with Weatherold. There are three curves they calculated for the vertical temperature distributions from the surface of the Earth to about 45 km altitude in the middle of the uh, stratosphere. Each graph was obtained using different CO2 concentrations, namely 150, 300, and 600 ppm, or part per million. Obviously, noticeable cooling in the stratosphere was predicted. The higher the altitude, the lower the stratospherical temperature will be. To be exact, the drop of the temperature around 40 km is over 12 Kelvin. Due to CO2 concentration doubling from 300 to 600 ppm, the predicted stratospherical cooling has been used to argue that the surface temperature will increase so that such a calculated imbalance in OLR can be diminished because of the surplus shortwave radiation from the sun. This argument is based on the assumption that each thin layer of the atmosphere can emit infrared ray as a black body does, with its uh, intensity proportional to the local equilibrium temperature to the power of 4 according to Stefan Boltzmann law. In their conclusion, Manabe and Weatherold claim that if CO2 concentration is doubled from 300 to 600 ppm, the surface temperature would increase by 1.3 Kelvin, or it could be 2.3 Kelvin when water positive feedback is taken into account. Or one can simply say the predicted warming is at least 1.3 Kelvin. Remember this number. For this reason, stratospherical cooling has been considered as a key prediction by climate modeling for surface warming, as repeatedly talked by several YouTubers, including Sabina Hausenford. Here is how she taught her audience to make their arguments. So if someone asks you what predictions climate models have ever made, the good answer is stratospheric cooling. And if someone asks you how we know it's not a change in solar radiation, a good answer is also stratospheric cooling. But the question is, how much warming can be predicted given the stratospheric cooling? 1.4 Kelvin, 2.3 Kelvin, or less than 1 Kelvin? Now, here is my latest answer to this question. To facilitate my presentation, I am obliged to rotate this figure by 90 degrees and then vertically flipped like so. 
I hope Sabina wouldn't mind by being brutally transformed this way. In order to make my analysis quantitative, I have digitally built these two vertical temperature distributions based on the original figure published by Manabay and Vesero. To make my calculation as complete as possible, I have also used the US standard atmosphere to extend the vertical temperature distribution up to 85 kilometers. Last year, I published a paper on how to calculate OLR, the outgoing long wave radiation, in the absence of the surface infrared radiation. I have recently modified my original formula in line with Simpson's early work in formulating the upward long wave radiation. To be specific, the thermal radiation intensity factor is now written as the product of the emissivity and the transmittance at any altitude, rather than just the emissivity, which is assumed to be proportional to air density. Here is a curve for altitude-dependent atmospherical radiation intensity. As you can see, the maximum intensity is located around five kilometers, but it is clear that no single emission altitude or single emission layer can be identified. By the way, this curve is similar to the Planck function for black body radiation. Here is my formula to calculate the outgoing long wave radiation or OLR for short, where T sub A represents atmospherical temperature at different altitudes. First, I calculate the altitude dependent OLR using the vertical temperature distribution reported by Manabay and Vesserold with 300 ppm CO2 concentration, which is almost the same as the US standard atmosphere. As you can see, OLR is zero at the surface, rapidly increases in the troposphere, but the growth rate gradually decreases and eventually becomes and symptotical constant over 50 kilometers where air density becomes almost zero. By choosing this OLR value at the top of atmosphere as a 239 watt per meter square, the effective air emissivity is determined as 0 0.336, which is the only parameter required in my calculation apart from the well-known vertical air density distribution. In passing, it is due to the exponential decay of air density that the atmospherical contribution to OLR becomes insignificant or almost zero toward the very high altitudes. In other words, the seemingly large cooling in the middle and upper parts of the stratosphere can hardly reduce the OLR anymore. Second, I calculated the OLR in the presence of the stratospherical cooling step by step for each altitude interval chosen, strictly based on the vertical temperature profile reported by Manabay and Vesserold in 1967, except for the temperature profile in the troposphere part. Why? Because first, I wanted to calculate the imbalance in OLR at the top of atmosphere due to the stratospherical cooling. It is important to understand that the stratospherical cooling can be caused by other processes, such as depletion of ozone layer, not necessarily by CO2 increasing. I will discuss this in the future. Look, here is a calculated OLR without invoking any temperature adjustment in the troposphere, 236.7 watt per meter square. What does that number mean? Compared with the unpatented OLR, 239 watt per meter square, my calculation shows that the imbalance in the OLR at the top of atmosphere 
is 2.3 watt per meter square based on the stratospheric cooling reported by Manabe and Visrod, which is less than 3.7 watt per meter square in the IPCC's reports calculated by integrating the radioactive transfer equation. Naturally, I would love to see how this imbalance in OLR could be diminished by adjusting the surface temperature and the temperature distribution in the troposphere as described by Manabe and Visserold. First, I increased the surface temperature by two Kelvin. Here is the calculated OLR after this tropospherical adjustment, 244 watt per meter square, which is five watt per meter square higher than the unpertinent OLR 239 watt per meter square, required by the energy conservation law at the top of the atmosphere. This implies that if we assume the surface temperature increase by two Kelvin, the cooling will occur on the surface. Therefore, we can see the two Kelvin surface warming used is too high. To cut this story short, I had used a number of different values for the surface temperature increases. Finally, the value for perfectly diminishing the imbalance 2.3 watt per meter square is, can you guess? 0.73 Kelvin, exactly. That's to say the surface temperature would be at most 0.73 Kelvin higher than 288 Kelvin when CO2 concentration is doubled from 300 to 600 ppm based on the published figure by Manabe and Visserold in 1967. Let's enlarge this part of the graph so that you can see the details. Here it is, 0.73 Kelvin. The number is very close to what Dr. Heidi calculated 10 years ago based on the greenhouse effect, 0.6 Kelvin. What a coincidence. Did Mana Bay and Visserold carelessly double their calculated surface warming too? Actually, the outcome from my quantitative evaluation of the work by Mana Bay and Visserold are not unexpected. If you read this paper published in Nature in 2012 entitled The Mysteries of the Recent Stratospherical Temperature Trends, you will understand what I mean. I remember only one observational evidence was cited by Manabe in his 2019 paper, 52 years after they made their predictions. As he wrote, according to analysis of data obtained from satellite microwave sounding and radio sounder measurements, the global mean temperature has decreased at the rate 0.4 Kelvin per decade in the lower stratosphere. But then he added, it is likely, however, that the observed cooling in the lower stratosphere is attributable not only to increase in the concentration of CO2, but also to the reduction of ozone in the stratosphere as pointed out, for example, by Ramaswamy. I hope this talk will help you to understand about uh, stratospheric cooling in the context of the global warming. Thank you for viewing. Thank you for donation. See you next time.